Beautiful. If you have your Bibles, you can open up with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, beautiful portion of Scripture. We started last week a series on uh, love with, with the month of February, and love is in the air, and, and I told you last, we all love a good love story, and I, I'm, a, I'm a hopeless fan of love. I, I love love. I love how quirky it is. I love how powerful it is. I love that love truly can make the difference. I love how love can capture a heart. Uh, love can make you do the bravest of things and the stupidest of things. Amen? Amen. Good. I'm glad you agreed with that. I thought I was going to be the only one. And, and uh, I love how, how uh, love functions. One guy or one person can walk by someone and nothing, and the next person can walk by someone and absolutely be swept off their feet. I, I am a fan of of love. I, I believe in love. And I think there truly is someone for everyone. And uh, we took some time last week and we talked about the love story of Hosea and Gomer. Hosea was a, a young prophet that had been called by God to be the mouthpiece of God to Israel, to deliver their message, to call them from their sin to repentance, to turn back to God. And, and he was just, he had young, he had potential, he had his whole life ahead of him and God to use him, God to, to do this kind of said, hey, listen, I want you to go and I want you to marry a prostitute. And I don't know how, how that handle was handled at home with mom and dad. Can you imagine? Uh, my mom and dad are here today, Joe and Jean Johnson sitting over here by my beautiful daughter, Sierra. They uh, came up uh, on Friday, came up for Brooks Shower. Thank you for all of those who who were a part of that, you guys just blessed them and blessed them and just blew, I, I walked into my house and there were just gifts everywhere and people resting everywhere and I, it was just, and it was an amazing day and you didn't eat all the donuts and I thank you for that as well, but you did eat, did eat all the bacon and uh, we're going to have to talk about that when my, when my parents aren't here so I can use strong words, um, but, it, it, I, but I, I don't know, Hosea going home and saying, Mom, Dad, I, I, I found the girl I'm to marry. Her name is Gomer, and, and she's a prostitute. I, I, just, I don't know how that conversation must have gone, but that's what God asked him to do. God said, I want you to go and marry this woman. And her, her name was Gomer. She was a prostitute. She, she lived that life. We don't really know how they met. We don't really know her story, but we know that they got to know each other and that he married her. And Gomer loved, I'm sorry, and Hosea loved Gomer the way God called him to and God had asked him to do this because he said I want Israel to see with their eyes what they do to me as their savior I love them I'm for them I provide for them I care for them I, I've opened up my arms my heart my life to be their savior and to be their Lord and yet they continue to choose to love another it's a really, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. And so they get married and things seem okay for a while, but then her heart, as you read the, the passages, begins to wander. And I don't know if she missed the old life or the excitement of it or, or maybe just being married to a prophet just wasn't what she signed up for. Thought it would be cool in the beginning. But I said last week, the only thing then tougher than being the mouthpiece of God to people is being married to one. And maybe she felt the pressures. And the thing is this, when your heart begins to wander, your life soon will follow. And you see that with her. Three children later, Hosea realizes that the children are not his. Gomer's sin is revealed. You can read through the second chapter. He's trying to get her to stop, to come back, to repent, to work it out. She won't. And she keeps chasing after other lovers. And, and finally, it just comes to the point that she just simply leaves she is done and she is not coming back it's tough Hosea dealing with the reality of his wife that though she has been unfaithful to him though she has left him dealing with the rumor mill that we all know can be strong and fluid all of the whispers after he walks around a corner the conversations that stop Explaining to children why mom's not home and where she is and that she's not coming home again. And, and the thing is this, guys, it would be very easy for us to judge Gomer. It would be very easy for us to sit there and go, oh my gosh, 
well, look at her. We see what she's done. What She's this kind of person, that kind of person. How dare she? And we left those kids, and that's just horrible. But you know what? What, what we really have to gather from this is, is we want to see her in a certain way. But what God was telling Israel and what we've been told is that this is what we do. That God loves us, and God is faithful to us, and God is is providing for us and God cares for us and he has a purpose and a plan for your life and fulfillment for each and every one of us found in his will and yet, you know, he, he provides, he protects and we so often can let our hearts wander. We can chase after things that we think will make us happy and things that we think will fulfill us, things that we think are, 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 that are good but we discover later that moth and rust can corrupt. And yet Hosea, even though he was hurt, and even though he was angry, and even though she had not been faithful to him or loved him well, he loved her faithfully. He loved her completely because that is what God had called him to do. And you see this battle going on in this man as he's gone. Because in the flesh, don't you just want to be done? In the flesh, you want to go, fine. You make your bed hard, you lay in it. That's an old southern saying, by the way. But there was this thing that God had put into him, marry her, love her. And so he loved her, and I'll never forget, he had heard through the grapevine that she had been deserted by her latest. She was going to be sold into slavery, and Hosea 3.1 says, And the Lord said to me, who is Hosea, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate the Lord still loved Israel. And even though the people have turned to their other gods and love to worship them. God's saying, even though, even though, guys, we wander. Even though, guys, we give our hearts to things that are sometimes contrary to the things of God. Even though we let doubt come in and doubt the love that is the most perfect, the most complete, lacking nothing love we have ever experienced. He says, I will not stop loving you. That's God's word for us. Let's just take a minute right now. Let's just pray right now. Father, right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that there may be those here today that, God, we talk the love of God. Father, we, 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 we function about it. But, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will drive that truth so deeply inside of us that we are loved by a holy, just, forgiving, gracious, generous, Jehovah Jireh God. That that love would saturate us, God. That that love would soften up, Lord God, our spirit and our hearts today to hear and to receive truth that our lives will be changed. That God, we can walk out of here today and never doubt again. That we can walk out of here today and never feel abandoned again, never feel lost again, never feel misplaced or just lost in the shuffle, God. That we can walk out of here and know that we know that we know that we know that we are loved by God. Thank you, Father, for that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Even though she had wandered. Even though she had been unfaithful, she was still loved by Hosea. And God said, I want you to go, I want you to seek her out, I want you to find her, and I want you to show her this love again. She doesn't deserve it. I know she doesn't deserve it. Lord, you know what she's done to me. Of course I know what she's done to you. Exactly what Israel's done to me. But I've not stopped loving them, and I don't want you to stop loving her. And so he goes. That's how God loves us. That even though we wander, and even though we give our hearts to other things, and even though we've cheated on God, when he has remained faithful to us, and he loves us. So Hosea, he goes, he finds her. He finds her chained to the, to the block where she's going to be auctioned off, not as a person, just as property. As the bids start going up, he keeps raising his hand, and by the end of the day, he buys back his wife who had been unfaithful. She was tired, she was worn, she was abused. That's what sin does to us. It uses you and then it abandons you for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley. And people must have looked at him a little crazy for buying back the woman that had betrayed him and abandoned him. But he took that shame because he loved her. 
And she, at the end, discovered the love that she had been looking for the whole time. See, the story of Hosea and Gomer is the story of God and Israel, but it's also the story of God and us. And it's important that we understand that. We all have to deal with the Gomer in us. We all have to deal with the part of our lives that wander, the part of our lives that give itself to another thing that's contrary to God. When we know what is right to do and don't do it, when we know His will, but instead we choose ours. When you and I cheat on God. That's a hard statement to say. But when we cheat on God, in those moments, when we are reaping what we have sown, that God cannot stand by and watch us be lost. But He bids on us to purchase us from our sin with His Son. And the Scripture says, but God so loved. That's it. That's the motivation. That's the foundation. So this morning, if you're enslaved, he buys you back. If you were lost, God will search and find you. If you're ashamed, God will cover you. If you're wandering, God will bring you home. If you give up on him, God will not give up on you. No matter where you are, God sees who you are. And he loves you. What God wants is for us to love him. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. God wants you to be in love with him, not mildly affectionate, not kind of, you know, if there's nothing else going on, I'll talk to God. God wants you to love him, and he gives us the power to do it. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, this is what the, the author writes, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his, God's, glorious riches, he may strengthen you. Everybody say you. You. With the power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted, everybody say rooted. rooted. Being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long And high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Listen, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, may I suggest you highlight this in your Bible? This this is a beautiful portion of scripture. God desires us to love him. And the thing that God's love is this. It is so amazing, but our flesh is so strong that we sometimes have a hard time wrapping our mind, wrapping our hearts around the love of God. Because you can come on a morning like this and you can have a really good looking pastor say, listen, God loves you. And you go, yeah, but. I know he loves me when I'm doing good. I know he loves me when I'm tithing faithfully. I know he loves me when I come to church like I should. I know he loves me when I don't yell at the person who cut me off in traffic. I know God loves me when I do good, but I don't know if he loved me last Friday night. I don't know if he loved me when I was out the other day and I said those things. I don't know if he loves me when I was was angry and I took it out on somebody. I don't know if God loves me. And I think sometimes we can wrestle. We have a hard time wrapping our mind around the love of God being too poor, uh, not poor, pure, that's better than poor, and, and uh, so pure, unconditional, that there's nothing you can say or do that's going to make God stop loving you. We have a hard time with that because we don't see that in the world we live in. like having a software that's having issues with an operating system. Does that make sense? I had to ask somebody. I wrote that and I thought, now I don't know anything about computers. I turn them on and I type and then I think I turn them off. Well, you can have a software that, that, that needs to work, but if your operating system is not going to work with it, you've got to get patches. You've got to get somebody who knows what they're doing. And I think sometimes we talk about the love of God, and God says, I need to download this in your heart. I need to download this on your spirit. You've got to get this inside of you so that it changes everything. Because when you really understand that you are loved by God completely, totally, on your best day and on your worst day, it will change 
your life. See, God knows that we need help, and so he's given us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has power. And that's what this portion of Scripture is all about. Now, when you read this passage, it's very much about the Holy Spirit and the power that he can give you. And most of the time, when we think of the Holy Spirit and power, I think of power to do something. Power to do this, power to do that, power to perform a miracle, power to change people's lives. And and the Holy Spirit has power to do all of those things. But what Paul is talking about here is different. He's talking about the Holy Spirit gives us inner power power a strength that he gives us so that we can know and understand and embrace the love of God so that we will be filled with all the fullness of God God says you can't get there by yourself God says you can't do it by yourself your flesh isn't wired for it your mind's not wired for it you've got to have the Holy Spirit come in and make that patch So that our feeble human minds can receive something that's unfathomable. And it changes us. He says it's different. And isn't that the goal of any relationship? If you're here today and you're married and you've been married a year or two. If you're here today and you've been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Isn't that the goal? Is that we want people to be loved completely. Fully. Nothing hidden, nothing held back, just given. Now with our flesh and sin, we fall short of that. And the thing is this, I don't want you to be selfish. I don't want you to be shallow. I want you to be authentic and full and complete. And Paul says, so that you may be filled. So Everything in this passage leads up to the end goal, which is what? To be filled. Our lives can be filled. And so Paul lays out his journey. He says, I kneel before the Father, surrender to God. Why? So Christ can be in our hearts. You will never get to the end game without starting at the beginning. And the beginning is this. You've got to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. All of us, every knee needs to bow. You're never going to find this kind of love in the world. You're not going to find it anywhere else. It is only found in Christ because he is love. We all have to bow a knee to him so we have Christ in our heart. Well, why do I need Christ in my heart? So that you can be rooted and grounded in love. And love is the greatest of these. Now, why do I need to be rooted in love? So that you can know the love of Christ. Well, why? So that at the end of our journey, we are mature, complete people filled with the fullness of God. So God gives us the Holy Spirit so the software can work. God gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can receive it, so that we can move in it, so that we can be full of him because he loves us and we can know his love. Paul's not talking about the exterior man. Paul's not talking about the the, the, the fleshly stuff. He's talking about the inner man. Paul is not this morning addressing symptoms. Paul is talking about heart issues. Now, there's a lot of colds floating around. There's a lot of flu floating around. There's a lot of, you know, sickness floating around. And and everybody has their way of adapting to it. Everybody has their, their, their flow of addressing it, their way of dealing with it. People do neti pots. You need neti pot people in here? There's a few of you. And, and I, you know, I've heard neti pot, heard neti pot. People say, oh, Pastor, you've got to get a neti pot. Because, man, when you get congested, you just get the warm water with the salt. And, and so I went up the other day, and I looked up a video. That's disgusting. Now, it's effective. It's effective. But so is snorting gasoline. You know, it'll clear everything. Get a big old chunk of wasabi. You know, my dad will tell you about that. But they did. I watched this woman. She's like, well, you got to tilt your head and you got to open your mouth so you don't choke. And she pours hot water in this nose and it pours out of this nose. And I was thinking, well, you know, if it works for you, it works for you. And, and that's awesome. And, and now for little babies, you know, when we were young, when we had, where's my wife? When we were little, not littler, younger, and we had children who were littler, we had the little suction cup thing, the little blue thing. You just, <laughs> you know what they have now? They have a straw. That's got like a little filter in it. And you put it in the baby's nose and you suck on the straw. <laughs> nope. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. O- others of you might take a shot of NyQuil. The nighttime sniffling, sneezing, aching, coffee, stuffy head fever so you can rest medicine. 
Maybe that's your way of coping. But the thing is this, all of these things, whether you neti pot or you gag suck a straw or you do NyQuil or whatever it is, all of these things just deal, they address the symptom. They don't address the root. And, and the thing is, guys, it is so easy to be tempted in this world to live at surface level. And we spend all our energy and we spend all our life and all of our time and so much money and so much effort trying to deal with the fruit of stuff. And Paul is saying, listen, you've got to get deeper. You've got to get to the heart. And that's what Paul is doing. He's taking us deeper to the root of the problem. He says, why do you argue in marriage? You know, do you like arguing? Why, do we, why don't we serve more? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm too, why don't we give more? Why aren't we more faithful? Why are we, and as a pastor, you can just go through the list of things. But the truth is, busy isn't the answer. It's deeper. It's deeper. And that's what Paul is saying. This is a deeper heart issue. And when we lack an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has given to us, we're going to wander. Do you understand who it is that loves you and how much he loves you today? I'm telling you that when you grasp that, when we understand, when we say, Holy Spirit, move in my life. Remove my doubt. Remove my flesh. Remove the things that limit me to just seeing love at at, at, an earthly, fleshly, shallow level. And Holy Spirit supernaturally help me to receive the love of God that is perfect and pure and complete and lacks nothing. I'm telling you, when you embrace that, your life is going to get easier, not easy, easier and simpler. It will do it. Paul's saying, I'm praying for your inner man. Not these external things. Not these physical things. Not the symptoms, but your core. Because if you really understood the love of God, you would sell with joy all that you have and go and purchase this pearl of great price. If you've ever met someone who's experienced this, you know it. You know it. They'll talk about who they used to be, and you sit there going, what? But they have such a confidence in God. Oh, I could be a knucklehead, but man, I'll tell you what, I am loved by God. I was joking with my wife the other day. So there's two things I know when I wake up in the morning. I said, one is I am loved by God. Loved by God. Two is you're tired. <laughs> I, just, I just know that. 26 years of married, I know. She's tired in the morning. And, and I said, but you can have it with confidence. Confidence that you are loved by God. And when you understand that, when you purchase the pearl of great price, there's not a symptom or an external thing that will stop you. You see, when we forget how much God loves us and how good God is, and he says to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And here's the thing, too often we kind of get it, and so we kind of follow him. We understand the goodness of God, it's a game changer. We understand the love of God for our lives. You will never be the same. It doesn't erase your past, it just releases you from it. That's the miracle that Paul is praying for here. Not a healing, although God heals. Not a manifestation, although God moves. But a miracle in our hearts that we would understand the love of God for us. And see, what happens is this. Pastors try to preach perfect messages. We want to answer every problem in life with a sermon. That's what we try to do. We get a sense in our heart. We try to write a message. And if it's good enough, if it's perfect enough, if it's right enough, then then people will respond. Worshippers try to pick the perfect worship song, try to lead the perfect song. Teachers try to teach the perfect class. But it's not something that any flesh can do on its own. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. We can pray, God, help them to understand the depth of your love. Because when you do, your life's going to be different. Your marriage is going to be different. Your schedule is going to be different. Your priorities are going to be different. And you're not going to feel the pain of it because you've embraced something that is so much greater. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. The, The New American Standard Version says that he may grant you to be strengthened. 
He may grant you to be strengthened. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how hard I work or what I do, I can't make you understand how much Jesus loves you. That is something that God will do supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, I can't make you fall in love with Jesus, but I can tell you about him. I can tell you who he is. I can tell you that he loves you more than your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife or your kids. I can tell you that he's crazy about you and that he loves you relentlessly. I can tell you that you're a sinner and that you rebel against him, but that hasn't stopped him from loving you. I can tell you that he gave his son to die for you, and three days later, he rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, and now that same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in me and has granted me the strength to understand the love of God for my life. And that changes everything. Man, we spend so much time and effort and money focusing on the outer man to look right, walk right, act right. When you focus on the inner man and ask God to grant you the strength to understand his love, that's when life changes. Because I'm telling you, if you've got to do all these things to act right, I don't want to be acting. I want to be being. I don't want to act like I'm walking different. I want to walk different. Because you stop focusing on the symptoms that just drain you and drain. You ever just get tired of fighting? Fast as you pluck the fruit, it grows back. Because we're not dealing with the root. That's what Paul is saying. Guys, you, you, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to help you. Because you will exhaust yourself. There's not enough counseling in the world to get all the apples off the trees before they start growing again. Just drain you, but if you deal with your heart, you begin to love God more than we love sin. And you will find yourself moving in a freedom and a liberty that you've never experienced before. We can be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, but we need to receive His love. You've heard me say this before. Jesus loves all of us, but He also loves each of us. And I believe that with all of my heart. Do you believe that for yourself? Or do you think that God loves you when you're getting it right and not so much when you're messing up? Let me ask you something. How much, how, 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 how well do you think God loved Jesus? How well do you think God loved Jesus? Do you think it was an average love? Do you think it was perfect? Because Jesus was sinless, right? He walked on earth. He, was, he, was, he walked, you know, faced the same things, but he sinned not. He was the perfect, spotless lamb. And so if we have this idea in our head that, you know, when God loves me when I'm good, but not so much when I'm bad. Jesus was perfect, and so there, there was no sin. So God, who is perfect, who is love, loved Jesus, I would say, perfectly. How would you describe that? Perfect, complete, not lacking in any way? Would you agree with that? If so, say amen. Let me read you a verse. John 15, 9, and it says, just as, everybody say just as. The Father has loved me, meaning Jesus. I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So if a minute ago we agreed that the Father loved Jesus perfectly, completely, not lacking in any way. And then Jesus turns around and says, that's how I love you. Just like God loved me, I love you perfectly, completely, lacking nothing. And then he gives us the invitation to abide in that love. Now, I can't do it in my flesh because my flesh is going to mess up. My flesh is flesh. But he says, you have an invitation to walk with me and to be loved by me. Just as perfectly, just as completely, just as lacking nothing. And some people get this, and when they do, it has changed their life. Others wrestle with this. You have a past, and, and people who, who, who should have loved you didn't love you. And you wrestle with, are you lovable? You wrestle with the security of his love for you. And it leaves you with an emptiness. I want to believe, but I wrestle. I want to believe, but sometimes I don't feel it. Well, well I want you to know that God wants you to be full of the full measure. God says, if you will ask the Holy Spirit, he will grant you strength to know. Not just here, but here. That you are loved. 
So I'm going to do a couple things. One is this. We're going to invite, uh, I'm going to wrap up. We're going we're to invite those of you who may need to come and ask God to grant you strength to understand his love. And understand something, God. It's a supernatural thing. It's a supernatural thing. It's not about how many sermons you listen to. It's not about how loud you worship. It's not about how many small groups you go to or how many chapters you read every day. It is a heart that says, God, I don't get it. And I hear you say you love me fully and completely and lacking nothing but God, my flesh. And what we're really saying is, God, if I was you, I wouldn't love me. We don't love ourselves. But being able to say, God, will you grant me the strength? Will you let the Holy Spirit move on my heart? So that tomorrow morning when I wake up, I wake up and I know I am loved by God. And it will change the way you walk. Some of you have family and friends that you love, but they're empty. They're chasing the love of this world. They're chasing the things that they think will sustain. They're, they're chasing other, other, other idols, other things. They're, they're, they're looking to fill their life. They don't understand the love of God. They're spending a lot of time trying to deal with the addiction or deal with the greed or deal with the stress, dealing with their heart. But their hearts are what need to be changed. And we can be like Paul. Paul, who started this whole thing, he said, guys, you want to get people to that point? You want to get people to the end game? He goes, I kneel before the Father. There's things that you want to do something for them? Pray for them. Get on your face and speak their name in his presence. Because if it's a supernatural thing, it's got to be the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we can pray for God to move. So if you've got unsaved loved ones, you've got family neighbors, you've got family that's wrestling, understanding the love of God, seek the face of God for them. And in just a moment, we're going to have you come because we need a supernatural response. The other thing is some of you this morning might be wrestling with the love of God. You're insecure and that you don't know where you are with God right now. And there are times that maybe you feel loved by God, and then there's times that you feel abandoned by God. You don't understand. You need prayer for yourself. Let's come together and let's ask God together to do the supernatural in your life. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you're on the other side of this, Man, the fight is worth it. The fight is worth it. When you get on the other side and it's just that element of just, I know I have 